For Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is DA Shadow Minister of Basic Education, Bakoli Leno Dada, to discuss rotational system in schools. Can you tell us why the DA feels so strongly that a uh, basic education minister, Angie Motecha, must scrap the rotational system and fully reopen schools? First and foremost, we need to understand the background of why schools were put in a rotational system to begin with. It was to buy time so that the health department, particularly hospitals, can prepare themselves to avoid high hospitalizations because teachers, one, were not vaccinated. Number two, they were at high risk of getting the virus and ultimately would have contributed to the pressure that the health system would have to deal with. If we look at it now, most teachers, over 90 to 95% of the schools that we visited, about over 21 schools in the past two weeks, have been vaccinated. And all of them in all provinces, in Bumalanga, Northwest, and the Free State that we ended with this week, have been asking for full reopening of schools because one, learners are losing over 40% of their learning and teaching time normally. What is worse is that rural farming and township schools are losing between 50 and 80% of their learning and teaching time, meaning that we're already exacerbating an unequal education system that already exists. So some schools are fully reopened because they can fully reopen. And these schools are now put in a rotational system, exacerbating a problem that we already have of learners that drop out. And you're looking at about 370,000 to 750,000 learners that have dropped out just in the past year. And what is now concerning to us is that by June this year, a grade three learner will only know what a grade two learner knew in 2019. And lastly, on this point, um, you would have seen recently, there were reports about high teenage pregnancy in schools, and you would have seen you know, how gender-based violence has rapidly increased because learners are given more time to stay at home through this rotational system and ultimately have a lot of time in their hands. It discourages learning. They don't play sport, so they find other activities to do. So there's actually a quite a, a lot of things that are affected by the rotational system. That's, so that's why we feel so strongly that it needs to be scrapped and schools must fully reopen so that learners can recover the lost curriculum time. So, Mr. Nadata, you've said that you will write to the South African Human Rights Commission to request them uh, to investigate the unjustifiable school regulations at the start of this year. Tell us about that. We've written to the South African Human Rights Commission and uh, we have received a response and acknowledgement of uh, our, our letter. And secondly, what we've done beyond that, because we had written to the president initially to say to him, he must consider this, put it to cabinet, and cabinet must make a decision to scrap the rotational system. And then the Minister of Cocta then uh, regulates that. He hadn't responded to our letter. But what we have seen in the past, in the developments of the week, is that they met with the National Corona Command Council, and uh, the DG um, indicated in, our, in response to us uh, that they've also put in a submission that the rotational system must be scrapped. But what we have further done is that we're uh, preparing to file court papers um, if the rotational system is not scrapped by Monday, um, we'll file court papers to make sure that uh, we compel government to scrap uh, this irrational uh, rotational system and go back to full uh, opening of schools. Don't you think that the schools that are still on the rotational system have an issue of overcrowding? Overcrowding is a systemic issue, and it's been there before. But it can't be an excuse of not opening schools because at the end of the day, these learners are set back between 10 and 15 years. They are going to be that type of generation that is unemployable, maybe dependent on grants and living a lifetime of poverty. And we can't exacerbate that problem because we are dealing with systemic issues. We understand that there are some schools, particularly in township areas, that have a, a problem with overcrowding. And we have been urging the department regarding infrastructure to get rid of pit toilets, mud and asbestos schools, and most importantly, giving support to those schools by temporary measures such as mobile classrooms, and ultimately a plan to build and expand those schools. But most importantly, we can't just have one dimensional thinking. We need to think about an online and homeschool-based policy so that we alleviate the pressure of overcrowding in schools so that more learners join the programs that UCT has started of online uh, learning so that we alleviate the pressure. So we need to think outside the box and be innovative and try and invest our time. And that's what COVID has forced us to do, to think about how do we use technology and innovation to make sure that we enhance learning. Mr. Notata, you are also concerned about the issue of dropouts. Tell us about that. Look, we're looking at between 370,000 to 750,000 dropouts. And it's a massive concern because these learners end up joining youth not in employment, education or training, 
which already South Africa is 8 million of them. Then they also count in statistics of youth unemployment, which is the you know, expanded rate is about 76%. So it's quite a massive concern that the learners drop out and that the Department of Education does not have a retention plan. There needs to be a retention plan if learners drop out how do we make sure that we get them back into the system before it's too late, before they fall into gangsterism, drugs, uh, crime, and ultimately, you know, uh, let their futures, you know, literally run down the drain. So that is the biggest concern for us. And we've given the, the Department of Basic Education solutions in this regard on how to develop a retention plan. And the Western Cape is a good model of how to develop a retention plan. And if you look at the results, you will see that the lowest dropout rate is actually in the Western Cape, very low compared to other provinces. But one of the highest dropouts rates is actually in the free state, where they are number one in metric results, but they are dropping out over 51% of their learners between grade 10 and, and metric. So that tells you that it's not a real uh, picture of what exactly uh, the learners that have gone through the system actually reflect at the end of the result. So it's important for us to have a retention plan and make sure that the department uh, gets those learners back into the system so that they have a bright future. FDA leader John Stian Hazen has also said that the rotational system is irrational. He said that your party is also compiling uh, court papers uh, to bring an agent interdict to direct schools to open fully. Are there any developments on this? There are definitely developments. We obviously uh, you know, have our ear on the ground. Our lawyers have been uh, preparing papers, but we've seen developments with the DG, the minister, and the president announcing that there's a possibility of them uh, scrapping the rotational system. So we don't want to uh, go ahead of that because at least there seems to be an acknowledgement based on the letter that we've sent to them. So we are saying that the deadline is now Monday. If that is not done, then we have no choice but to file those papers. We are talking to you uh, after also having seen that um, the 2021 metric results are out. And in your statement today, you are mentioning that uh, the 76.4% that was mentioned by the minister is misleading. Why do you say that? Like I said to you, you cannot uh, calculate metric results simply based on the people that set uh, for the metric results. You need to calculate metric results based on the number of learners that enrolled to complete metric in grade 10. And that was over 1 million learners, close to 1.1 million learners. Only about 800 and something thousand learners wrote the metric exam, which shows you that there's already a dropout, right? Then you then have to add the number of learners that actually failed for you to be able to see what the dropout rate is to get a real metric pass rate. And I can guarantee you the metric pass rate is lower than what is uh, purported. And this thing of whitewashing the metric results and window dressing as if we're doing very well is not good enough. When we look at uh, the metric results, we need to look at the number of learners that enrolled in grade 10, how many of them actually completed the exit the system, which is after the metric exam. But most importantly, what is the quality pass? So what is the bachelor pass? Because in our country, right now, if you pass, I mean, I'm telling you from a person that has been dealing with students at a university level, that if you pass with a high certificate, realistically speaking, your chances in this country are very low. If you pass with a diploma, you've got limited avenues for you to go into. And we are now dealing with a crisis where the education system is not responsive to our economic needs, the, the, the jobs that are available in the market, the innovation that is needed in the market, and the skills of artisan, maritime, and all of that that are needed in the market. So when we actually look at the metric results, we need to be honest with ourselves and look at the learners that have dropped up and how do we retain them. We look at the pass mark and the pass rate so that we make sure that it's of a quality pass and that there's a future for these learners. Because ultimately what you're doing is parking them in the system for 12 years and there won't be anything after that. They'll be dependent, like I said, on grants or government support. And ultimately they'll join the unemployment queues because they can't access other opportunities. So that is what we're saying. And there will be a statement that was released today with the real metric pass rate, with the figures that have been dropped down. We have analyzed the report, we've seen it, um, and you will see when we release the statement of what the real metric pass rate is. How would you rectify or how would you make sure that our education system in the basic education is well run in the country? What, what areas would you look at? So first and foremost, is curriculum that is relevant for the economy, the job market, entrepreneurship and innovation. Mm -hmm. So you need to identify specialized schools. You need to look at what uh, economic needs there are and develop that. So there is something started about entrepreneurship, maritime, 
coding, but you look at you need to look at the economic needs of that place. The Western Cape has got a model called the collaboration schools. The collaboration schools basically partner up with the private sector. You look at what are the needs, the economic opportunities in that environment. For example, in Jake's Khawa, it's an agricultural environment. So the school that they have there is everything to do with what the agricultural sector, whether it's you know producing wine, uh, food, um, and whatever is in relation to agriculture. If you look at Kempton Park, it's an aviation space. That's where all Tambo Airport is. So the schools around there need to be able to develop uh, people that are uh, aviators, people that can uh, be mechanics in terms of uh, planes and so on. So that's the thinking. You specialize in, in making sure that learners have a skill that they can use in, in contributing to the economy so that can, they can build a livelihood for themselves. Secondly, the type of infrastructure we have in some schools, particularly in Limpopo, Eastern Cape, one of the most poorest provinces, Pumalanga, you still have pit toilets. You still have margin asbestos schools. So those environments are not conducive for learners to, to, to study. And we're still backwards. We don't have access to Wi-Fi, ICT, and technology, which, by the way, has, is advancing at a rapid pace, meaning that you're leaving those learners behind. The most important one is quality teaching. The quality teaching is important in the classroom to make sure that whatever teacher is in front of the learner can produce quality education for that learner to be able to take in the knowledge and ultimately produce good results. These are some of the aspects of our, our policy. That's what we implement, by the way, in government in the Western Cape. And that's why you see that there's a lot of quality passing. There's a lot of, uh, you, you don't see challenges of infrastructure compared to other provinces. There's technology that has been advanced and there's a collaboration with the private sector that is then saying, this is what, these are the economic needs you must respond to as our basic education sector. And lastly, we are talking to you after you have been traveling to different schools. I'm sure to check if, all the schools are ready for 2022. Are you able to report to us uh, your findings? What I can report there is the, the Northwest is a mess. Uh, the Northwest schools are a mess. Um, there's very poor leadership. There's sabotage from the department. The Department of Education there is uh, under administration. So the department basically looks over them um, and uh, it needs uh, an intervention uh, to make sure that uh, we produce uh, good results there. And Pumalanga, on the other hand, uh, one aspect of it, you know, the, the township uh, location schools are struggling a bit in terms of uh, uh, getting learners in and controlling learners and giving quality teaching. Uh, there are some good pockets of excellence there where there are some schools that are fully reopened, producing good results. And the Free State, I think, is a very good province to model farm schools. And they're, they're doing very well. They've got very strong leadership. And I think it does show in the results and in essence. But the biggest challenge with them is that they've got a very, very high dropout rate. But the common thread across all these provinces is that teachers are saying schools must fully reopen. And that's the first question I ask in every school. Like I said, we've been to over 21 schools and all of them are saying schools must fully reopen. So there's no rationality in keeping the rotational system because they can see the effects of, of learners. I'll give you an example. There's one school that uh, Brains Flay that we went to yesterday. They've got a hostel of over 350 learners. So they rotate those learners every week. So one week you're at school, the other week you're not at school. The one week you're at school. So you can just imagine that in a month, there's four weeks. You're losing half the month. And in some instances, some get absent, some don't come back, and they're complaining about a very high dropout rate. So these are some of the issues that we've picked up. Um, and uh, we, we obviously will compile a report and present it to parliament for adoption and recommendations that need to go out uh, for, for, that, uh, for that issue to be dealt with. There was the a Shadow Minister of Basic Education, Fakoli Leno Dada, in conversation with Polity about the rotational system in schools.